Oh, good. Oh, oh it's from last week? Yeah. Okay, never mind. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Don't worry if you see me squinting. There's a reason for that. These whole, this whole glass, th the glasses thing is kind of a new thing to me, and I kind of forget them like every time. So we're picking up with Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 this week. Okay, class. We're going to get started. What was that song by Simon Garfunkel? Silence is golden. <laughs> okay, will you open us in prayer? Sure. Father, thank you for this time that we can come together to study your word. We ask that you open our minds and our hearts to understand the things that you have to tell us and to find ways to put it to work in our own lives. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we, we're probably not getting a lot done today because I have like four verses because there's a lot of meat there. And it's not something I want to fly through because it's the these verses are really um, important for us as Christians on our, our living because um, they're real practical. But I guess that's a big piece from it. Um, and I, I want to just kind of pick up in verses 4 and 5. Paul was saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be made known to all men. The Lord is near. He's talking about, he's kind of got this peace going on, this, this idea here. You know, we have joy. And where's our power? Is in the joy. And how we're living. And the idea we talked about last week, which is being cognizant of how we live, people see. Because what we want to be living is a way that we live a testimony. People see us. You know, Peter, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in you. Comes from where? A question. Somebody's asked you, how can you be joyous? How can you go on when this has happened to you? Okay? And we've got to live that. And then we've got to see it. And in verses 6 and 7, he talks about where the secret for this power is. Verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. So he's told us to rejoice always, and now to pray always, and not to worry about anything. They're all three, all encompassing. There's no like, oh, by the way, this is the baggage of worry you can carry. He doesn't give you a little, little book where he's, okay, these are the kind of things you can worry about, and, and don't worry about these. I don't know who it was, but I heard uh, it was uh, Dr. McGee was talking about it. somebody who went to her pastor and said, Do you, is it okay to bother God with our, our little things, our trifle things? And the pastor said, can you tell me what you have that's a big thing to God? You know, the creator of the heavens and the universe who spoke it into being, what's going on in your life that's, a, that's not trivial to God, relatively speaking? When you're dealing with the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, immutable God, what's going on in your life that's a big deal to him? What can he not handle? See? That, that's really good. So... When he says re, uh, rejoice always, and again I say rejoice, that's what he means. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, do what? Let your request be made known to God. Okay? There's no exceptions for rejoicing and for praying and avoiding worry. Now, what Paul is not doing is suggesting this idea that... Um, you see in the culture today, it came from Peel, you know, the idea of speaking your own reality. You know, your arm is broken, so I'm not going to believe my arm is broken. That's out there. The, you're, you, the name it and claim it, if you don't, you ever heard of that? Okay, well, if you haven't heard about it, it's secular, and it's been, it, it has morphed itself into the church in a lot of venues, and you'll even hear people saying as well, you know, you had a car accident because you said you didn't want to be in a car accident. Well, no, that, that is secularism. That is, that's actually Eastern mysticism. Okay, the whole karma thing. Things happen to people, why? God allowed it. God allowed it, but why does it happen? 
Bad people sometimes do bad things to good people. There you go. That's part of it. And sometimes we do it to ourselves. Sometimes we do it to ourselves. What else? We live in a world of sin and death. I mean, We're in a world of sin and death, and bad things are going to happen. In this world, what did Jesus say? In this world, you will, have trouble. You will underscore, will have tribulation. So when he tells you to be anxious for nothing, rejoice always, because he knows what's the potential. Well, what do we have a propensity to be? Anxious. We have a tendency to be anxious, and therefore we have a tendency to do what? To worry. Worry, and therefore we do not, we don't rejoice. The reason he's telling us this is because if you don't, if you deny this, which is a lot of our culture today, you're going to be miserable. And you're going to be looking for answers and you're never going to find them. And there's a whole lot of this on TV today where they're telling you, well, if you want it, you know, just speak your reality. No, that's not it. But on the other side, don't deny it. If you want a college degree, what do you need to do? Go to school. Go to school. <laughs> you, know, you don't sign up, you're not getting your college degree, right? And if you want to become a mechanic, what do you got to do? You gotta bust some knuckles. If you've ever done it, you know what I'm talking about. Right? Little slide draft carburetors on your triumph. Right there by the head head gasket, the hot one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You gotta get inside there and do it. If you want to know your Bible, just put it under your pillow, go to sleep at night, and say, God, let it just kind of morph into my head, right? Does it work that way? No. No, you got to apply some sweat and work. So Paul's not saying deny our reality. We're not to ignore them. We're not to pretend everything is perfect. I only tell you this because there are people making loads of money, driving, flying around in their own private Lear jets, who are on TV telling everybody that's all they've got to do. And they get a lot of money from people sending in money because it does what? Makes them feel good. Huh? Makes them feel good. Yeah, it tickles their what? <clears throat> that's what they want to hear. We all want the pill that we can take and does what? Take it away. Changes whatever we don't like. We, you know, we live in a world like, oh, where's the pill? And, and the, again, I just tell you what, if you watch the world, TV is replete with all these, take these pills and fixes all your problems, medically, emotionally, physically, whatever. It's not always that. Sometimes it's put the donut down and walk away from the table. Okay, so we have to acknowledge that bad things happen, sin does exist in the world, and if you want any biblical proof to that, I'll give you two to think about. One is a guy named Job, and everybody knows, or in the U.S. it's Job, you know what, everybody know that story? What was Job's guilt in, any, in, in losing his, his daughters and his sons and losing all of his flocks and everything else? None. 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 Second guy. I don't know if you've heard of him. His name's Jesus. Why did he have a bad day at the office, as it were? He told the truth. He told the truth. <clears throat> right? Bad people do bad things to good people sometimes. Evil men are vindictive. And sometimes they do it just because they're evil. What about Herod? How about all those little babies that got killed? Evil. He was just evil. Yeah. What about the story where um, Jesus says, do you think that, that those 16 uh, men that the tower fell on were any worse sinners than you? Because that's what they said. Well, the, the, there was a tower that fell on a group of, of men, and everybody they, surm they surmised that that was God judging them. Bad things happened, therefore God was angry. And he says, no. But unless you repent, you too will die. What is he saying? Bad things are going to happen in this world. They're outside of your purview and mine. It, they're not outside of God's. Don't worry about what God is allowing. God is God. And he does how many things wrong? None. We don't always have an answer. Our human nature, we want an answer. We want to know the three-letter word. Why? Why? We always want to know the why. And that's the book, I don't know if you've, if you've caught that, the book of Job is a big question mark. 
Job is looking for the, why me, dear Lord? What is it? And, and, but where does he get to by the end of the book when, once he's confronted with God? When God says, okay, stand up and answer me like a man, he squirms down on the ground and says, I can't. Now, who am I to challenge God? How can you rejoice in that? Yeah. Mm. It's not a, it doesn't mean you're joyful. I mean, I'm speaking from personal experience. But you do rejoice because God is sovereign. And you know, whatever he's doing, he's, especially being his child, that whatever is going on in your life, he's doing what? He's doing a work in you. If he's permitted the bad guy to do a bad thing to you, God has a purpose. And it could be like Pharaoh to raise him up so he can knock him down and show himself powerful, but also to judge Pharaoh. Okay? But you can have bad things happen in your life because God may be wanting you to see something in you that you didn't know you had, good or bad. Good or bad. He's working in you. You can rejoice when it says, you know that in all things God is working for the good of those who love him. He's saying that in whatever's going on in your life, he's working in you. So we can rejoice that God's working. And you can say, we're, you know, look for that direction and guidance and do that through what? Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplications, let your request be made known to God. So, you know, God doesn't say you can't come to him and say why. Editors know you probably won't get the answer necessarily. But times you do. Or times it is after the fact you get the why. You may not get the why today, but you'll go down the road many years and you'll look and you'll see God did a thing back here that was very unpleasant, very hard. But you can look over, I'm doing some date calculations in my head, 37 years and you can say, well, I can trace my life from that point to where I'm at today. Okay? But that doesn't mean it was, I wasn't really angry. It doesn't mean that I didn't take it to God in prayer, but I did get the relief that God was in control. He wants you to take everything, your concerns, <clears throat> your fears, and your challenges to the Lord of prayer. You want to open up, have an open and honest dialogue. If you're hurting, don't try to act to God like everything's just peachy. I got it, God. <clears throat> Job didn't do it. Paul didn't do it. Jesus didn't do it. Remember the garden? Jesus was in the garden, and he wasn't saying, I can't wait, was he? What was he saying? If it's possible, if, if you've got another way, I'm open to it. <laughs> We've all been there. You're going through something in life. I've been there. God, if it's possible. And then God just came back and said, this is the road you're taking. And you know what? It wasn't easy wasn't fun. You know the story of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? I just love that one because remember the king says, you know, you do this, you're going in the fire. That was pretty, you know, that's, you think about that because that, that, that um, furnace is like probably sitting right over there. I mean, I, I think the, the, the king knew how to uh, um, get people to acquiesce to his requests, you know. And I'm sure that these guys are standing there and he's saying, you're going in the fire. It wasn't like the fire on the other side of the hill, we're going to take you there. I, I got to think and it was like right there. It was a real threat. But I love their faith because they've been in prayer because we know that, right? That's who they were. Said, you know what? Our God's more than able, but if he doesn't, know this. We're out of your hands today, God, uh, King. Whatever happens, we know we're out of, we don't have to worry about you tomorrow. A lot of times we kind of, we elevate the human to the divine and they're not. What if you stand up for what's right at work and you get fired? God will provide. God will provide. I, I can witness that myself. I had a buddy, uh, it was October 6th of 2006, they came in and they said, all the guys are gone, I had to go tell my buddy. And he's like, God will provide. I felt bad because I had no control, but that's what it was. I got that... Um, 2002, I was actually on the, making the, I had the phone up to call the airline to make reservations for a trip to Hawaii, and I got an email, five minute meeting with the boss, I called Terry and said, they're going to fire us all today. She goes, how do you know? Five minute meeting in five minutes? Guess what? All the consultants, APS was like, you're all gone. And you know what? I had to walk over to some place 
and just step in to see somebody and they're like, where have you been? We need you. We've been down for four days and I've been there since 2002, 21 years. It's amazing how God works. Matthew 6.25, I say to you, don't worry about your life or what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body or what you'll put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Same thing Jesus said. That's 625. What does he say in 633? Same book, same chapter. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day will have enough trouble of its own. That's really hard to grasp and hard to implement. But that's why I want to be in the Word to remind us. What are you going to worry about this stuff for? What about your life? He says, seek what? First, the kingdom of God. And I think when we do that, as we seek God, He changes our worldview perspective of what's important. And we can be like Job when he lost everything. Naked I came into this world, and naked I will leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay? It happens. Life happens. If you're attached to things of the world, if you have the car or the house or the family or your bank account or the job, and that's your all, all in all, your end all, and it goes away, what happens? God's still there. God's still there. Think of the world, though. It goes on. Think about the millionaires that commit suicide. Multi-millionaires commit suicide. And the rank and file masses of the world are shaking their head, scratching their head going, excuse me? But you know what? We all want to be, you know, most everybody wants to be that multi-millionaire. And these guys commit suicide far more frequently than I think we realize. Because they find out, like Ecclesiastes, it's vanity, it's vanity, it's all empty. Look at what the Ukrainians are going through. All these people did nothing wrong. Yeah, probably the biggest crime is there's the, the Ukrainians actually had a very uh, strong Christian basis compared to a lot of the former Soviet bloc nations, right? How about when the um, I don't want to get political. But when the U.S. turned a blind eye to the invasion of Lebanon by Syria and they killed 200,000 Christians, and then they left, do you think they didn't have a purpose in going in? They had a definite purpose to go in, under the guise of Satan. Okay? What did the Christians do to deserve it? Nothing. Nothing. They just happened to be in a fallen world with fallen people. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, he tells you the same thing. He says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Everything give thanks. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. What does God want you to do? First Thessalonians. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. In everything give thanks. You don't want to, I don't get too personal, but there are points when you may find it really hard. But that's the instruction God has given. Sometimes we have trouble doing that because we misread the scripture. Yeah. I heard a lot of people say, "Oh, you're supposed to give thanks for everything," and that's not what it said. Joyce, in it. We give in. Yeah. Give thanks in. Yeah. So. Because we know that no matter what we're going through, the Lord is still there. Yeah. Twenty <clears> third <throat> of December. Sprawled out crying. Just don't let her go on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. Um, but I knew that God was in control. And God did answer me. She didn't. She, he gave me about another month with her. But in that, what I could rejoice was I knew where Terry was going. I knew Terry was not afraid. I knew Terry was strong. And she was a great witness. But you know, the rejoice is there will be that day, Isaiah 50, 64, 25, so, that before, you, before you called, I answered, before you, you spoke, I heard you. That's, that was where I came on that day, was 
the day will come when God will call and Terry will be healed and she'll be whole. And so you rejoice. It doesn't make it easy on my part. It hasn't made it easy on my kids' part, right? But in that I can rejoice because I have a God who lives, a God who's alive, a God who has come back from the dead, and a God who hears and a God who understands and has that love and compassion. And in that, God can work and show you things in you you did not know you had. You may have believed you had it, but you didn't know you had it in you until that time, until, that, until you're confronted with it. It's all theory, right? <laughs> they got a movie coming out about this, but it's all theory until they pushed the a button and that big boom in the uh, Nevada desert went off. It was all theory, right? Then they said they had a 97% chance it wouldn't ignite a continuous, ongoing nuclear reaction throughout the whole globe and just obliterate it. 97% chance it wouldn't do that. First Peter, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in proper time, casting all your anxiety on him. Why? Does anybody know the rest of the verse? Because he cares for you. Because he cares for you. That's why we take our cares and our concerns to him. I've had God say that. Why? You, know, you ever have God ask you why? Why should I do that for you? I'm asking him for something. Why? And all I could come back to was, because you love me. And you know what? At, at the moment of that, it was I had this peace that came to me. Because that was the answer. God was going to do, whatever God was going to do, he was going to do it. And as you know, obviously, Terry is not here. It's going on 17 months. But God was there, and he does care. And if he does care, what's he going to do? What's God going to do if he cares for you? What's best for us? What's best in his world, I mean his perspective, from his world view, his perspective. Because he sees everything. We always see the moment, right? Mine came down to, I can heal Terry. Sorry to be so personal, but he, and he went through this list with me. He goes, do the boys, which would be my grandsons, do they want to go through this again? And I was like, no, Lord. And then it was like, do the kids, the three kids, do they want to go through it? No. Do you want to go through this again? I go, no. And then he said, does Terry want to go through this again? No, no, she doesn't. She's ready. I wasn't. But she was. So God cares for me. So he gave me, he had grace for me, and somehow, because I can tell you at that moment, you don't think you can, but 17 months on, God has done a wonderful, wonderful work. I want to quote, a, and don't anybody leave, because he's a Roman Catholic uh, Frenchman, okay? Francois Fenelon, Fenelon. But listen to what he says about prayer. He was a theologian. Tell God all that is in your heart as one unloads one's heart, its pleasures, its pains, to a friend. Tell him your troubles, that, that he may comfort you. Tell him your joys, that he may sober them. Tell him your longings, that he may purify them. Tell him your dislikes, that he may help you conquer them. Show him the wounds of your heart, that he may heal them. Lay bare your indifference to good, your depraved taste for evil, and your instability. Tell him how self-love makes you unjust to others, how vanity tempts you to be insecure, how pride disguises you to yourself and others. If you thus pour out all your weaknesses, needs, troubles, there will be no, there will be in, you will be, excuse me, troubles, there will be in lack of what you want to say. There will be no lack. You will never exhaust the subject. It is continually being renewed. People who have new, no secrets from each other never want for subject of conversation. They do not weigh their words where there is nothing to be held back. Neither do they seek for something to say. They talk out of the abundance of the heart without consideration. They say just what they think. Blessed are they who attain to such familiar, unsecured intercourse with God. And I love that. If you're, if, you're, if you're struggling with what to pray about, start opening up your heart to God as you would the dearest friend or the friend you wish you had that you didn't have to tell them, to tell them about the mistreatment in your life as a child or at work. The difficulties you've had, like how I wish I didn't do this, how I wish I overcame that. How I struggle with this. 
God knows it. He just wants you to bring it to him. Because what's he going to do? He's going to work a work in you. And I think sometimes we, we kind of look at it and we figure we have a problem. Who's got to fix it? <clears throat> Me. But Paul says when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. When I'm finding out I can't fix it. When I find out I don't have an answer. But I know who does. And I take it to him. Then I find he does a work in me. If I'm going to fix it, God is going, a gracious God that he is, he says, go right ahead, Rex. I'll be right here. When you fail, guess what? My phone number hasn't changed. You can call me right back up. He's gracious. It's just how much pain do you want to go through to learn your lesson? I saw a video the other day. It was really funny because, you know, in our culture today, we want to put everybody in these little rubber balls and not get anybody hurt. And he had this little boy, and you know, I can relate to this. He's coming down at a campsite in a wagon, you know, a four-wheel wagon. And he is just breakneck speed, tumbles, does the crash and roll, comes up, and he's like, yeah. You know? But the whole time, Mom's like, don't do it, don't do it. But he did it anyhow. You know? He learned a lesson. Right? Uh, and that's us sometimes. We go through it, and God's like, don't do it, don't do it. Okay, I guess you're going to learn that way. Right? I shared that with my grandson, the littlest, the oldest one. He was little. And his mother, he was fascinated with my halogen light on my desk. And he just wanted to touch it. Because it wasn't a big light bulb. It was a little one. So the big ones are hot. Little ones, they can't be hot, can they? And Josh was bound and determined to touch it. And, of course, we all knew in the house the moment he touched it. Right? Because what do we hear? The blood-curdling scream from about a, about a three-year-old uh, from touching it because then it was burned. And it was funny because I still remember the next morning I woke up and he had a towel on his hand like this big because he had me put ice on there because I'm grandpa, right? I've got ice on there and I've got it wrapped in a towel of a towel and that's how he had to go to sleep. Now this is like five, six hours after it hurt, but he knew it still hurt. What's funny was five or six years later, probably six or seven years later, Aiden, his younger brother, who's like three at this time or two, he wanted to touch the light. And Josh was like frantic, don't touch the light. And I love that for me because that is a picture of our lives, my life. How many times has God said, don't touch the light? And I touched it. So now what's my job? Tell your little brother not to. Tell my little brothers, brothers and sisters in Christ, that's not going to work for you. You're not going to, that one's going to come with a high price. I, I still love that. We're encouraged here to bring everything to God in prayer. And I, I got to tell you, folks, when we talk about, we have the monthly prayer thing here, the, the, you know, and we announce it. Um, if you haven't been, I really would encourage you to put it on your calendar. At least show up and find out what it's about. Because I'm going to tell you that from all the people I've known who've been attending here for the couple years that we've been doing it, it it's always a blessing and it's not the same thing every month uh, every month the elders and the pastors we pray about what where does God want us to be at this time sometimes we pray for outside we really focus over there somewhere um, other times like the last time we took individuals um, who had real prayer requests and we prayed there and then for them and what's really funny just like um, Francois said in the 17th century there was no lack of what to pray for. If somebody says we're hurting because of this and we start praying for them, we eat up the time to the point where like, you know, the, the traffic lights are going to get turned off pretty soon. If you're older and you came from smaller towns, you know what I mean by that, right? There's a point where the traffic lights, they just turn them off, right? Because it's real late. Well, we're getting late. And we finally got to say, okay, we got to wrap it up. People have things to pray about. And I find that, you, you know, you don't have to come and pray out loud. You can just pray with the brothers and sisters in Christ because your prayers count. And eventually, God, I think, through His Spirit will move where He might squeak out a little thing. And as you do that, it opens up to your heart and then you become more comfortable in praying out loud. You don't have to. Not everybody does. But being here is support for those. Like um, Bob and Kathy had us praying for one of their grandsons. So you, you know what? We all prayed for them. But you know what? Everybody going out of the building that night knows that Bob and Kathy are asking for prayer for their grandson. Pat Hammond shared about uh, a nephew 
that had a, was in a, involved in a, uh, I guess I would call it a freak accident. Um, but he's like seven or eight years old, and he's pretty well damaged for the rest of his life now. So you're praying not only for him, but how about the mom and dad? How about the uncle who was in charge of the vehicle when the accident happened? That's what we get by praying. And don't hold back on your prayers. Pray about everything. If you're having a bad day on the golf course, good advice is to pray about it. Not that you always listen to that advice, but it's good advice. Because you got no hope of calming down otherwise. <laughs> you take a 13. But we won't talk about that anymore. <laughs> um, here in our prayers, what? Express gratitude that God has in, in, in anticipation of the answer. See, when you pray as a believer, you can write this one down in your Bible. God hears you. He hears your prayer. Okay? Now, we have a couple things to consider. Sometimes we pray amiss. Correct? Or am I the only one that's always done that? Anybody else here kind of get on the wrong tangent on their prayer line? Right? So as you know, as God has heard you. So let's, let's stick with that because it's, you know, it's probably very infrequent, so we probably need to talk about it. When you pray amiss, what's the point in praying? To get God to move? Tell us to. What, what, usually. What, what, what's, what's, the, what's the end then? Why would you move? Hmm? To get me to move. Bingo. See, we start out, and God knows us. And, and we, we may be sincere, sincerely wrong, but we're sincere. And God has to show us that maybe, maybe that person, I'm going to stick with this one because maybe they did you wrong. And you're coming to God and telling God, you know, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, they did me wrong. I always park my car there. That is where I always sit. And they took it. Now, God, you don't have to judge them that hard, but burning their house down sounds like reasonable, right? <laughs> Again, I, 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 if I, you know, I'm sure, you know, that's, that's just, if I'm the only one, I'm sorry. But, you know, we, we pray about this stuff, and really what it is is God to say, okay, they did you wrong, We're, and I'm more seriously, but is that the end? No, because what's your problem now? Forgiveness. Usually. Forgiveness. You've got to deal with that. Now, if you've forgiven them, God's got you there, right? That's great. Because then you're just saying, God, I've, this has happened, and I'm forgiving them by the power of Christ, I'm forgiving them. Then what's the point? <laughs> right? Well, God, maybe they're doing it to other people. Right? But a lot of times it's God's got to move us to where we're, we're not coming with, I forgave them. We're wanting vengeance. And God wants to move us to the point where we realize that's not God's end. God's end is forgiveness. In grace. We're praying about our job. We have a really bad job. Or we've had a job. We've been driving from northwest Phoenix to south Mesa for three and a half years while they're building an overpass at the freeway. So it's an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes every day down and back. And then you're freed from that. And then God says, you're going back. You'll be a mile closer, but you're still going back. And you're telling God, like, God, I don't want to go back to Chandler. I don't want to go back out to East Mesa. And God says to you what? I didn't call you to a job. I called you to be a witness. Your bloom goes. And guess what you do? You go back to Chandler. You get put in the second floor in the back room in the back corner with a, in a bunch of empty desks where people only show up for like a half an hour a day before they go into the fab at Intel. But you get stuck, because they had two people do cubicle because it's so infrequently used. And I'm there the whole day. But Tom May gets put, is it, I'm in his office. And just through time and talking and working, he comes to the point where, I heard you talking on the phone to your pastor. What do you guys do with church? Because we went every Sunday, but we never did anything after that. He had a little two-year-old. He says, can I, can I talk to you about this? And I don't lose sight of where God put me. And what he told me, I didn't call you to a job, I called you to be a witness. Understand how I was explaining to God, I didn't want to go back there, I didn't like to drive, I didn't like the miles on my car, it was expensive, and it was like, I didn't call you to a job, I called you to be a witness. So sometimes God has us in an unpleasant place, and it's in prayer where we're telling God what we don't like, 
what we don't, what is not pleasing is that God will then speak to us and then we realize we have the wrong perspective. Because I guarantee you that had God started out with, I'm in prayer, life is wonderful, and he said, Rex, you're going to go, uh, Jonah, go to Nineveh. Right? <laughs> right? He didn't start there. But I was Jonah. He just didn't tell me I was going to Nineveh. He told me I was going to Nineveh. You know, I was going back to Intel. I was going back down to Chandler Boulevard, which was Williamsfield Road at the time, right? I was going back down there, and that's what he wanted. But it was only in prayer where he, he didn't tell me that I was going to meet Tom. He didn't tell me I was going to get to meet with Tom and share the gospel with Tom, right? And it was God's timing because it was shortly thereafter Intel cut their consultants again. IT consultants got cut, and... I was off to another job, but I got to meet with him a couple times and give him the gospel. So that's in, as I'm praying, God moved my perspective. Moved my perspective. I, I give you a whole list of times where in prayer, God has changed how I viewed what I was praying about. And I think that's one of the big things we miss, because what we're doing is we're praying about it and we're worrying about it. I'm worried about driving to Chandler. And when God gives that to me, I literally just said, okay, I'm up. And I told Terry, I said, I'm going to Chandler. You know? And then it was, you know what was amazing was the drive, the hour and a half to an hour, 45 minute drive every day. Not an issue. And at the whole time, I wasn't looking like, where am I being a witness? I just was doing my job. And then Tom out of the blue approached me. And I've always thanked God for that because that's not who I am. One-on-one -on -one conversations with strangers. So we have God always hearing your prayer. God is always answering them. And we know, we've all heard it, there are three answers that God gives to prayers, right? Yes. No. Wait. Not now. Maybe there's a fourth one. It's like a modified yes. Because there's the other side where, you know, God knows what he has planned for you, and you set the bar down here, and God says, no, no. I'm thinking up here. Right? Right? We're, we know what we're afraid of. We're human. We're always thinking we're asking God here and he's going to put us where? Way down here. But God is a good and gracious God. He wants us to bring, I can tell you this, we're, we're, this is good stuff. Um, so what happens when we don't get answers? What happens when they're not the answers we want? We whine. We do whine. What are we supposed to do? Rejoice always again, I say rejoice. Why? The Lord, is near. the Lord is near. Rejoice always, always rejoice. The Lord is here. The Lord is here. He's got you. And if you're asking for something and God is telling you no, do you know why he's telling you no? That's it. The summary of it is for your own good as God knows it. You ever heard of a guy named Chuck Smith? Calvary Chapel? Yeah. He had a wonderful story about in Tampa, and I don't know if you know Tampa, but it's a big harbor, Tampa Bay. Ridge. And it's you've got to either drive two and a half hours around or you can take the 40 minute over the bridge or 20 minute, whatever the thing over the. And so he was on one side, need to get the other, and everything that morning went wrong to get ready to be a speaking engagement. And he, he has a far more, but the whole story was everything that could go wrong did go wrong, and he's freaking out, and he's, un, you know, I'm on a schedule, I'm this, and that. And as he's fl driving over the Tampa Bay Bridge, all of a sudden the cop goes blowing by him, lights and sirens, gets to the top, turns his car sideways, and stops him. That was the day the tugboat drove the barge into the bridge, and the bridge collapsed, and they still don't know how many people drove off the bridge in the middle of the night without anybody knowing the bridge wasn't there. And it was a huge drop. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what? I was upset that I, my, I burned my shirt with the iron or my tie was wrong or whatever. And I learned that sometimes God is stopping me from what I'm asking or wanting to do for something I have no idea about. But God does know. If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. The, you remember the barracks in Lebanon? When I was in the Marine Corps, the Navy chief who worked with me was the oldest serviceman killed in that. And I talked to him before I, he did, I, I got my discharge, and I said, Are you go, what's going on? He goes, well, 
is I can either retire or come in for two more years and get the third star for the Navy Chief, Senior Master Chief. He goes, I don't want that. I don't want to go back to sea. Well, he obviously went back to sea. But I always looked at it was maybe that's why God had me get uh, injured and sent out. Because I could have been in Lebanon. Because that's what Marines do. Because my buddy who I was in with was on the carrier deck set to go in the next morning. Because he was a chopper pilot. But by one day, it wasn't him. And see, we just don't know how our life plays out. God does. And there are things that don't happen in our lives that we want to have happen. And God has his reasons. So we've got to rejoice in. We're not rejoicing in them. We're rejoicing in that God is in them. And he is near. He knows what's going on. And if you've got a no answer, that's the best answer. Even though you wanted this, or you wanted to go there, or you wanted to do this, you wanted this to be you. Um, God took the big picture and he said, this is what I've called you for. Because ultimately, that is number one. Not what you want, but what has God called you for. And two. Right? Where is God, what is God's purpose in your life? What is his calling? And I think a lot of times we're in prayer about what we want and where we want to go. We're not asking that question. What, what are you calling me to, God? Now, God is going to call you to something, and you know what he's going to do? He's going to prepare you for it. Can you think of a couple guys in the Bible that God prepared them for their ministry by giving them an unpleasant life in front of their ministry? Anybody? Huh? Joseph. How about Joseph, right? Joseph. Okay, you can read Joseph. He has a great story. Might have been a little arrogant, might have been a little cocky. A couple years in the prison, God kind of fixed that problem. But it made him to the point where when he was tempted, he could stand the temptation against it. Right? He was strong to stand against it, went into prison, but then God came out and he was doing a great job. How about, how about somebody else? Just to think about. David, when he was chased around by Saul for years. What did David learn? Okay. We'll read the Psalms. David learned a whole lot in those times. But David was also a great example. If you read the story, he had a couple chances to take Saul out. In the whole secular world, his own men said, this is the hand of God. Right there. I mean, here, just, I'm going to take care of him for you, David. You won't even have to do it. Remember, he was sleeping on the ground there. He goes, I'll put his own spirit through his heart. David said, no, you can't touch the Lord's anointed. And then when the two guys came and said they did it, guess what happened to them? They paid, because David says you don't do that. David's another good example. How about Moses? He went from the pinnacle to herding sheep. What did herding sheep teach him? Huh? Patience. You know, the, you know the joke about herding cats? Well, the sheeps aren't much better, I don't think. What did Moses do for 40 years? He, he herded two million hybrid cat, uh, cat sheeps, <laughs> right? Could you could think about it? When you think about the picture, the Bible talks about who the sheep are. You know, if you're not raising, you know, that's us. We're all sheep. We all do what? Wonderful. We all like sheep do what? Wander astray. Have gone astray. And that's what Moses got trained in. But God knew where he was calling Moses, so he had to... Prepare. Sometimes, folks, you're getting prepared for something you have no idea God's taking you to. No idea. Um, and I can get, I'll go back to myself, of what I can see in my own life, how God has worked with Terry's death, things I've learned and things and the opportunities God has now presented. And it's just, I couldn't have done them before. And candidly, I would have loved not to have had to done them. But I have to come down to where, what has God called me to. Why? How do I know? Because I see where he's working in my life today. I see how he's working in my life. Books. I've given away a book easily 12 or 15 times about grief and sorrow and losing somebody. And God has just worked. A um, week ago or so, I had to go up to a bike shop in North Scottsdale to pick up my son's bike and my bike. And in there, uh, there was a guy that came over and we heard us talking, and he's like, oh, hey, I know about it. I go, hey, Vance, I know you. 
I met you earlier this year. You lost your wife in March. I lost Terry in January, January four. And he's like, oh, yeah, he remembered. And then Vance looks at me and he points to the guy behind the counter. He goes, Kevin lost his wife six weeks ago. All three of us are former Marine officers. And I said, I was able to openly witness there. I said, amazing how God works. Here are three of us, all former Marine officers, in a bike shop in North Scotts Hill. We've all lost our wife. I said, that's not but by the hand of God that we're here. There's no coincidence. So then I got to talk to Kevin pretty long. And, you know, I told him, I said, you know, my, name, my phone number's in your computer system because you guys work on my bike. If you ever need to call me, just go into that computer and get my phone number. You have my permission. It's not meant for that, but you can use it for that. You can call me anytime you want. Well, I couldn't be there if everything was hunky-dory with my life. I couldn't have been there for Vance when I talked to him earlier this summer when he was like three months into it. I was, I was six months into it. It wasn't much better, but I was a little bit farther along. That's where you see how God is working even though you're praying no, no, no. And God's going, yeah, it's going to happen. That's why we rejoice we know God is working. And I remember telling Bud this when he called me that day. I said, I know that in this, God is working for my good. I don't know what that good is, but I know he's doing something because he's not going to do this. God's not that kind of a God. He's a gracious, loving, caring God. He's working in my life for good. I don't see it. I don't taste it. I don't smell it. But I know that's what's going on. So I can rejoice because God is sovereign. He's omnipotent, omniscient, immutable. All those great characteristics. Um, it's always in accordance with his perfect wisdom and love for us. And that's really important for us to remember. When we're suffering and dealing with issues, whether it's a loss of a job, loss of a loved one, troubled children, troubled sisters, troubled parents, whatever is life that's not working, troubled finances, whatever, bad economy, bad government, whatever, God is working in your life. And if you submit to him, if you go to him, you'll make it through. Read the book of Jeremiah if you want. Read the end of it. Jeremiah had a, a helper. And his name is like, uh, like Bar Baram or something. Anyhow, he goes to God and he says, you know, hey, you know, Jeremiah's been getting mistreated and I've been his guy. I've been here the whole way. I've been, I've been taking care of your prophet. And he, like most of us, you know what he said? What's in it for me? Don't worry, Peter said the same thing. Hey, we've left everything. What's in it for, for me? And, and God told him, he said, this judgment is on the whole land. Everybody's going to lose everything, but you'll get this one thing. It's going to be so valuable to you. You get your life. See, God is the, the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the one that directs the paths of our lives. And what he was telling this guy was, there are, going to be there are going to be a lot of people dying. But I'm going to make sure, because you've been faithful to Jeremiah, you won't be one of them. And so whether your house is burned down and all your clothing are taken and all your food is taken, you're going to be happy because you're going to be alive. And you'll see a whole lot of dead people around you because of their sin. So even in that, when you realize God loves you and whatever he's permitting to come to you, it's, it's, it's managed by or through his love for you. He's never going to overdo you. Okay? Uh, Luke. I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it is open. <clears throat> now, verse 11 of Luke 11. Now, suppose one of your you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he asks for an egg, will he not give him a scorpion, will he? If he then, if then, <coughs> sorry, verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Knock, seek, and find. It's not people, places, and things. Jesus is saying, you want to ask God for the Holy Spirit. Because what does the Holy Spirit give you? I'm sorry? Wisdom. Comfort. 
Faith. Faith. Anybody know that? Galatians? Love, and joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. See, we, we kind of read that. Well, I can tell you the name it and claim it group will read that and say, you don't have your Cadillac because you didn't ask for it or your, your BMW or whatever it is today. Somebody's talking about, folks. You want the peace of God which passes all understanding to guard your heart, your soul, your mind in Christ Jesus? Ask for the Holy Spirit because God is more than willing to give them to you. The thing is, when he gives them to you, you got to do what? Listen to them. See, when the Holy Spirit tells you, don't say that, you know what he means? No. Don't say it. When, when the Holy Spirit says, go and apologize, you know what he means? Go and apologize. Go and apologize. Because, you know, we don't like it in our culture, but when you go and apologize and it's hard and it hurts and it humbles you, that's exactly what God wants to do. Because you know what's likely to happen out of that? Nothing. You're probably not going to do it the next time. You don't have to. Well, if you've shot your mouth off and you're apologizing, you'll learn to control your tongue. If you lost your patience and you've been paying for patience, you want patience right now and you didn't get it, and you've got to go apologize to somebody, that's the work God works in you. You know, we kind of think that, you know, God is just going to drop this magic wand on us and, oh, so I've got patience. How do we get patience? <clears throat> give me something to be patient about. Yeah, it's a learned trait. How do you learn forgiveness? Huh? By forgiving. A learned trait, by forgiving. What does it mean? That, you, that means you had to get hurt. You had to forgive. That means somebody did something that you had to forgive them of and for. Right? All those fruits of the Spirit only come through, dare I say, trials and tribulations, and they're many. Because we're fallen and we're broken and we don't always get it the first time. Right? Ephesians 6.18, with, with all prayer and petitions, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. It's the same thing. You know, if, if nothing else, I will hope we all walk away today saying, I need to be more in prayer. I need to be constantly praying for whatever's in front of me. I need to be, you know what, everything's going great. Well, how about you take time to thank God for everything going great? Right? You know, the uh, culture kind of looks at you if you pray over your food. But you know what? You could live in a country where there is no food. Or the food is hard to come by. Or the food is really iffy, right? Um, anyhow, Colossians 4.2. We're going to end with this group here. Say, Michael, can they close the door? Thanks. <clears throat> it's not 10 yet. i got three minutes. <laughs> Devote yourself in prayer. Keep alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Praying at the same time for all of us that God will open to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I am also been in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. See, there's another part of prayer. So you're like, you know, God, everything's going rosy. I thank you for that. I got no problems. I don't have to forgive anybody. Nobody's done me wrong. I really don't have anything to pray about. Yeah, you do. Pray for others. Pray for the pastor that he'll have wisdom to give the word out. And the pastors, he prepares for the, for the sermon. Or as I prepare. There are plenty of things to pray. If you have a brother or sister in Christ who you know is having problems, then I pray for them. See, we make it very myopic. We pray about ourselves and our families, which is fine. But we often not have missed the opportunity to look around us and pray for those who are around us who have needs. And that's what, he, that's what in Colossians, he, he's telling the Colossians to pray for him. He says, pray that God opens the door for me, provides that opportunity, that I see the open door. See, Paul was the apostle, but he still said, hey, I need people praying that God will open the door, and I'll see it. And then we get this peace. And, it's, and that peace is a guardian to us, protecting our hearts and our minds. Because if we get the peace, we, we, we leave the worry behind. Um... And again, we talked about last week about the idea of, of the witness. 
When you have turmoil in your life and you are living in peace with God and you're able to go through it, again, you're not denying that things are happening. But you have a quiet resilience in Christ. The world does see it. Now, they may not be there today, but God knows that at some point, everybody is going to face some form of what you're facing today. And that's why he's brought them into your life. And it may not be, but for a number of years down the road. But when that time comes, they know you're the one to call. They know. My, my brother-in-law lost his son uh, February 2nd, 2000. He was 21 through a gunshot. And I, I was talking to him a couple of Fridays ago at lunch. It's funny because we're both at lunch. We, we got together to talk about business and something else. And we got up talking about Clint and Terry. And you got two of us at lunch crying. Because uh, it's still there. But, what, 23 years after the fact, the church he goes to, it's a big church in the valley. One of the pastors lost a son and he was really struggling. So another pastor called my brother-in-law and said, Hey, can you meet with so-and-so? And he sees that opportunity, although every time he talks about his son, 23 years after, it's sad and it hurts and opens up all those pains. But he said, you know what, I come away knowing that that man needs me more than I need to be feeling good about myself. And that's through prayer. Being prepared to say, God, I'm available, use me. Um, carry your burdens, seek the Lord in prayer, and if you do... You'll, you'll find the peace that surpasses all understanding. I gave you a couple more verses. Um, we'll end with this because it's time. But prayer to me is a very big thing. I don't know if you picked that up. Prayer, prayer is kind of the proverbial where the rubber meets the road in our Christian walk. Uh, because a lot of times it's very ethereal. It's up here and, and it sounds good, you know. But you need to take it in prayer like I said, whether it's forgiveness, worry, anxieties, joy, get in prayer. Pray, you know what, you want to pray beforehand. You know, this, the picture Paul gives about the farmer sows in anticipation. Well, if he doesn't sow, what does he harvest? Nothing. Nothing. See, we oftentimes think we want to wait for the emer we want to wait till we're the, on the Titanic and then we start praying. Good picture, right? What you want to do is you want to have your life wrapped in your lifeboat labeled out, right? Well, you do that by praying. Because oftentimes I've, I have found that's where God works. I'm praying today and God is getting me ready for six months down the road. Something traumatic happens. And I've been built up a little bit to be able to process it and handle it by prayer. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day and all that you have to say is about prayer. Prayer is so important, Lord, because that is the means by which you've given us to talk to you and for you to talk to us. You talk to us through your word, oftentimes in a very general sense, sometimes in a specific sense. But we know that prayer is very personal, it's very specific to us, our family, our needs, our wants, our desires, our concerns, our joys. And we pray, Lord, that as we go out, Lord, that we will rejoice always, and again, we will rejoice. But in everything, with prayer and supplications, we will let our requests be known to you. And we know, Lord, that your peace, which surpasses understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.